Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's premier talk show about Gnosticism, the ancient Gnostics, mysticism, meditation, society, politics, consciousness, time and eternity, and whatever else we feel like talking about. My name's Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and joining us today is our guest, Matt Chrisman, from the Chapel Trap House and Time for My Stories and Kush Vlog and at Kush Bob on Twitter and a whole bunch of other amazing things. Hello, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, Matt, you're, you're sort of part of a, an unofficial mini-series bonus episodes that, that we're starting to do that I'm, that I'm calling Life in the Black Iron Prison, where we're expanding out speaking to just Gnostic practitioners and academics about Gnosticism to talk to people from other spheres of life about Gnostic themes. Now, before we get into uh, the Q&A, into the interview, uh, unfortunately, the, the most powerful archon, the one that has to be served, is the, the Master Mammon. Uh, we are brought to you by viewers like you. Uh, we are listener and viewer supported through patreon.com slash Gnostic. I'll throw that up on the screen here. And you can subscribe for as little as a dollar per piece of content per month. In exchange, you get early access to all of our shows and you help to spread the light of gnosis and we don't want to put anything behind a paywall so if you want more just message me and i'll try to give you more just tell me what you want people to sign up for our patreon and i'll do it uh if you're unable to donate financially you it can really help us out just by telling people about the show putting it on your social media uh liking subscribing you know the drill you can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash gnostic and uh yeah, that is the commercial. Matt Christmas. Uh, my first question is, why are you interested, what seems to be recently, in having conversations about spirituality? And the second part of that question, are you starting a cult or joining a cult? Ha! Uh, I definitely am not joining one uh, because I know that my understanding, my spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it, is too specific to really, for, to allow me to subsume it into anybody else's paradigm, anybody else's symbolic uh, language. So I would have to be starting my own, but I also don't want to do that because uh, it doesn't really seem like they tend to work out too well. You, 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 what you end up having to do, I, I, I think, is in order to like communicate your understanding to one that could be like durably transmitted to a group that can you know organize around it, it's going to be a lie, like all languages, as Nietzsche pointed out. And that means that all of the activities that are going to wrap around that central spike are going to end up coming from uh, fraudulence. And so uh, it, the math doesn't work out. So no, there will be no uh, cult. Uh, uh, but uh, I have been, yes, like starting to grapple with spirituality. Uh, and I, because the beginning of the pandemic saw me reach a point of like personal crisis uh, that I was unable to use my conventional methods of, of escape, of, of ignoring, you know, the, the, the spiritual sort of uh, void at the center of my life uh, because I was getting older. Uh, also, I was literally trapped in my own home. Yeah. Uh, and the political project that I had sort of put a lot of my own investment of, of, of ego and, uh, and meaning into was also falling apart. So that's the classic cliche, almost midlife crisis moment. Uh, and instead of deciding to double down on all of the most superficial uh, sort of distractions and, and indulgences, like you know, I'm gonna buy a boat or something, I, uh, I just, I, I, I looked inward because I felt something yeah. because uh, I had reached sort of the end point of being able to reason my way through life. Reason was having a diminishing returns and being able to provide me with any basis to find any reason for being, any reason to do anything. And so uh, I just had a feeling, I had an emotion and that emotion uh, fortunately for me, I was in a frame of mind where after I had the moat, the feeling, 
I had a vocabulary internally that allowed me to talk my way down from the feeling, still having an idea of what it is so that it didn't become evanescent, it didn't fall away and become just like a weird thing that I couldn't really place or slot into the rest of my life, which I think is what happens in most, for most of us, we encounter these really powerful feelings that do speak to something more that transcends our understanding of the world, but because we don't have the vocabulary to make sense of it to ourselves, we can't really keep it. Yeah. And I felt like uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to, to myself anyway, start uh, putting words around this feeling that made sense to me. But uh, since I was still isolated, you know, I, I needed to have a practice that allowed me to continue, you know, resuscitating that feeling and, and reaffirming it. And that's when I started doing the vlogs, which was an attempt to sort of talk out what I was thinking and, and try to explain to others in words uh, what I was feeling and, and where I think that came from. And, it, and because I got a response, because people seem to, there are enough people seem to be saying that they felt like I was getting at something that they had felt, that it felt like I was speaking to something that they had experienced. That made me, that kind of grounded me in a sense of, uh, uh, of reality, like that this was a real thing, that this is not me sort of delusionally trying to create a story around an experience. And ever since then, I've just been on this path of trying to find the most, you know, because this is sort of, I, I woke up to this life with these relationships and with this uh, job, if you want to call it that, and this audience. And now I have been trying to integrate this feeling into this, this place in the world and to try to use the one to uh, express the other and vice versa. Uh, Matt, this, this sounds like I'm I'm trying to be funny or facetious, but has anybody said to you, are, are because you're talking about spirituality, hey, are you okay? Like, are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Uh, like, and I, of course, have off, I have over the course of this period been like, am I okay? And I and I have absolutely seen uh, ways that that this whole experience could have been very uh, bad for me. Like in the in the sense of me getting like wrapped up in a because if you're using words to try to make sense of an experience, you're lying in a way. Like you are, you're having to approximate, and every level of translation is a level of latency away from the actual feeling. And so that means that if you are if you get caught at any one of those semantic levels and you fixate too much on reifying that what is really just an attempt to explain something using metaphor. If you get too latched into the metaphor and, and fixating on making the metaphor real, then you are going to go away from sort of some of that feeling that really does ground you and that removes the terror, really does remove the terror of existence, the stuff that makes you, that makes it hard to live, that makes it hard to see what's in front of you. Uh, and you eventually end up losing that in the pursuit of, reifying the metaphor because the reality of life in, in America at this point is of isolation. And, and like those feelings are, are, are best maintained through connections to others, through communal experiences. And we don't really have a lot of those. And now specifically in COVID time, we literally are, are separated from each other. So it's a lot of time by ourselves. And the more time you're trying to think your way around these feelings, the more chance there is that you can kind of just hit the wrong note and end up going off uh, into the wrong area. And, and, and what uh, the vlogs have done for me is constantly ground me. Because like one thing I would often say, especially in the early ones, when I was really sort of getting conceptual, is I would say, does that make sense? <laughs> and I was sort of like, just beg the audience to give me some sort of feedback and the fact that I would get a lot of people saying, yes, it does, you know, that was really reassuring. And the fact that, like, these aren't people who had any, uh, they didn't know me. And I mean, yes, they had parasocial relationship with me. They think I'm their friend in the way that, like, uh, internet celebrities are to people. 
but they were under no real obligation in that moment to lie to me, you know? So the fact that I, and, and I was getting, you know, private messages from people and, and, and the things they were saying, they all sounded like they were screwed on tight. And so just having people who seemed to be relatively uh, uh, well-adjusted saying this makes sense, uh, that helped, that was another thing that helped me sort of stay grounded and, and prevent, because what happens if you, if you lose the connective connection to others, if you, if you stop making sense to others, then you start doubting, at least I, because I am like a inveterate skeptic, like I've realized that about myself and it's something I'm having. And I mean, I, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a process, you know, of overcoming that skepticism. And I think that I am doing that, but it still is so deeply like hardwired into my responses that if I am alone for too long, you know, and if I am too caught up in building an abstract model, I'll start to doubt myself. And once I start doubting myself, I can create just as convincing a negative structure that undermines everything. And that says, actually, no, but what you felt is, is uh, it's your body telling you you're gonna die or it's like, it's, it's, it's a delusion or something. Uh, and it has been the ability to build some sort of, you know, makeshift online pseudo community that has done the work of, of grounding me. But then also, you know, finding people in my life. I've been very fortunate to find people in my life who have helped me make sense of uh, my feelings and have, uh, yeah, affirmed for me that uh, I am in fact okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so you were literally just on a podcast, which we'll link up in the notes, uh, talking about Gnosticism. Uh, a death is just around the corner. Uh, and you were talking about the need for, for a genuine Gnosticism. And uh, you've also referenced the world's rulers and actually a, a few times uh, as archons. Now, yeah. I know it's kind of in a joking way, but instead right. of, say, calling them ghouls or demons. Yeah. Um, and you're also on another podcast, which we'll link up, talking about demiurgic consciousness. So, yeah. a, a two-part question. Is is there something right now about the world that seems to particularly resonate with Gnosticism? And do you personally find the Gnostic mythos and the Gnostic impulse, you know, resonates with you in some way? Uh, it does, and I think it's, it's because, so, the way I imagine it, like, I'm not a scholar of this stuff by any means. I, I'm, I'm, I'm lightly read on most subjects. Uh, that the, the monastic impulse comes from believing uh, the truth of Christianity and then finding yourself living in a world where living Christianity, living a Christian life is impossible. Yeah. And trying to make sense of how that could be. And I feel like now we're at, get, we have, of course, replaced, you know, uh, the spiritual world with a totally uh, secular one and with a secular set of values and a sort of a secular uh, eschatology uh, around uh, like, per, depending on your you know, political uh, position and, and class, like around personal virtue or, or if you're super rich, literally physical immortality or uh, whatever it might be, or like the sort of vulgar, uh, uh, like materialist eternity of, of evangelical Protestantism. But however you, you slice it, the world that we live in now is one where it's impossible to be a human of any kind, let alone a Christian. It's impossible to, to feel, to have emotional uh, connections because, because the market has fully stripped us of our capacity to act out of any motivation other than the most base self, the most base short-sighted self-interest, which has stripped us in a real sense of our humanity and turned us into the the ants in uh, uh, the uh, the ants on the column from uh, uh, the Once and Future King, where everything that is not forbidden is compulsory. And if you live in that world you have that same instinct of I'm a human being and this is an inhuman world. Well, how can that be? How can a world made up of people be constra constrained physically, like in the real material of its being uh, from actually acting as individuals, acting as individual human beings? 
like through, from a from an emotional from a connection to each other, but instead only through like these dead market relationships. Yeah, yeah, that's it exactly. And you know, you may not be a scholar of Nazism, but I I think you did really capture the essence of it. And just a struggle to be human, right? It's it sounds like a contradiction, but uh, I would say the Gnostics argue to be fully human is to be fully divine. Uh, yes. yes, and we live in under a world system, and we uh, numerous world systems throughout the history of, of of humanity that strip us of our humanity, that stop us from being fully alive, from being fully human, from being fully connected to ourselves and to others. Um, Matthew, what does love have to do with solidarity? Uh, I think love is uh, a solidarity is the social expression of love. I think solidarity is is the connect is the understanding the recognition at an emotional not intellectual level of the of the uh, fundamental connection between all human beings and then solidarity is the uh, attempted uh, material expression of that uh, it is it is it is a, a a practical frame of mind that directs your action or it should direct your action. Uh, uh, that is motivated by a recognition of others, not a renunciation of others, which is what which is what capitalism insists upon. The capitalist uh, world, the, the the demiurgical world we live in, insists that we are all separate from one another, that we are individual, that we are homo economicus, that we are all self interested economic agents who have no connection to one another. And of course, that's. That is not just wrong. It's 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 literally, I think, by any means, any any de any definition, it's a blasphemy, because the connection between all others is the sum total of like spirituality of all religions. It's all an expression of connection of unity. And so, like capitalism is like the final heresy. It is the, the insistence that you like that you are an individual. Like that, and, and Ayn Rand is sort of like the is this the closest thing we have to like a like a antichrist of the modern world in terms of articulating intellectually a, a a world that is the literal opposite of its existence, and that in a world that if we continue if we insist on acting as though it were real, we will destroy the world and each other because we are literally operating in in um, in defiance of the fact. Of our connection and solidarity is is the social expression of love that that denies that that denies the false notion that we're separate from one another yeah well that actually leads in uh, quite well tonight to my next question talking about that that false sense of being separate the false sense of the individual so th there is a lot of discourse in say political circles about uh, false consciousness and the simulacra or the the dream world of cyberspace and of course the gnostics were were very big on the illusory nature of of this world and how humans are deceived both by internal forces and external forces uh, matt uh, are we in a dream world what's keeping us in this dream world and how do we wake up we are we are in a dream world we are in a false world because uh i would say at base because we're afraid of non-existence yeah. we're afraid of not uh, because we know we are a, a finite we know that we're mortal beings but our minds are also the sum total of the universe because we live these separate, segregated, fragmented, atomized lives, and with access to more information than anybody in history has had access to, which means we can realistically fa fantasize that our minds are a, a some sort of version of the universe, and it is finite. So, like, it's literally, we literally live, all, we all live lives of apocalyptic dread, because, like Ayn Rand said, when I die, I don't die, the world is going to die. And that is how we all uh, uh, operate. That's what we operate from. And that's the, that's the fantasy. That's the illusion. The illusion is of a separate self that needs to be protected uh, psychologically. Uh, because all of the most self, the self-destructive things we do, the things we do to flee from one another, to flee from connection and to flee, flee from, to flee from love, are in the pursuit of distraction, are in the pursuit of 
reifying our own, uh, a fantasy of our own eternal existence. It's, it can't last, but it doesn't have to. It only has to last long enough for us to get the next thing that keeps us uh, in that, on that track. But everything we do to build that separation, it reifies in the world uh, a, a, a situation where humans are put against one another, are exploited, on be, one, one group exploited on behalf of the other, and another group exploited and exploiting at the same time, and, and people living literal lives of separation from one another, where we interact with one another only through symbols, through what we never have uh, in, a, in a given day a sum total of experiences that are present that and the and that can have a presence that transcends our illusory egos and so the world that we have because we have technology at our fingertips to shape the world through our decisions through our consumption decisions we are making a fake world we're making a world where things exist that have a permanence that is metaphysical in our minds like private property for example that are not not real at all, but that structure our day-to-day -day life, structure our emotional responses, structure our desires, most of all, and that leave us unable to connect. And the only way that we can wake up is if we feel something. And the 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 you know the the tragic sad reality is is that as capitalism accelerates, the opportunities to feel at all are reduced like we have a, a person w being born into even into suburban comfort as it exists in, in america at this point will have in their life far fewer opportunities to connect to other people uh like to be in the same room with somebody looking them in the eye all that cliche stuff uh then generations before did even their parents did and they will be spending more of their life than ever before in front of a screen with a simulated reality that is literally a simulation. Like it's not even figurative. It is an actual expression of the simulation that we live in around us because the, uh, there are so few pleasures to be found in the actual world as we have created it because of how socially impoverished we are. There is no amount of indulgence that most of us can access that can make up for the loneliness at the heart of modern life. That this internet exists as like this final frontier of fantasy within the fantasy where we can uh, escape to find some meaning and find some feeling. And we do find meaning and feeling, but they are this copy of a copy of a copy. They are, they are a pale, pale, pale simulacrum. And worst of all, uh, they are, it's a sterile meaning. It cannot, it cannot transcend the falseness of the simulated reality because uh, caring about it requires you to buy into the fantasy in the first place. So working within it cannot break you out of it. So uh, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grim situation, but we break out of it because we still have human hearts we still love we still have a feeling that no matter what we try to uh, how we try to deform it and modify uh, commodify it it's always there this this love a felt connection to the world around us and the people in it and that means there's always every day a chance to have an experience what, what experience that is, I can't say, because it's got to come from a personal, one's personal life. And, 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 and it's going to involve like an intersection of past and presence and emotion that it, it's, a, it's, that it's all fully uh, embedded in that moment, like defined by the reality of the moment. But what I now know is that that is there, that can happen, and it's always available. And if that's true, then as bad as it looks and as broke and as uh, entranced as we it is, it does seem like we really are within this, this, the demiurgical uh, uh, iron prison, the, the chance to transcend it exists for anyone. And if enough people are able to have those experiences and bring themselves together and cooperatively act, 
where they are not building uh, organizational structures that require like compulsory mechanisms to keep people on the same page because everyone is actually operating out of a base self-interest, even if they think they're operating out of like some liberatory political agenda. If they're moving in the same direction because of their heart, not because of something that they've convinced themselves is like a utilitarian good, then the power that they have in, the, in, in acting is, is massively more powerful than the structures of compulsion that have been created because they really only work on you if you let them. And at some point, we all have the power to just say no. Um, so I'd argue, and, and let me know if you agree or disagree, but I, I would argue that uh, irony and sarcasm were, were originally a means of the critiques of, of our society, right? It, it's an almost yeah. a Gnostic meta-impulse that consciously or unconsciously was, was aimed at a kind of liberation, at least socially. And this was especially big for Gen X, but of course has you know, a ripple down to the, the, the generations after as well as the entire world. Now, however, it seems that irony is now a, a trap. Like, what happened? I do agree, yes. Irony is originally a way to, uh, to get some sort of truth out of the, the, the big lie of the social order because like, all the culture that a, a uh, exploitative uh, uh, world that is designed to reinforce difference, reinforce exploitation, uh, its culture will take all that is bad and tell a story where it's actually good. Like that's what the, that's what the super cultural superstructure is. It is a story to tell you, hey, you know all those bad feelings you have. Well, uh, the things that's causing them are actually good, and the things that you're seeking are actually bad. And that whatever culture it is, whatever whatever mode of production it is, that story uh, is the story uh, that you hear and that you experience through culture. And that means that like the emotions you're expected to feel are generated by that same uh, upside down moral order. And so irony and sarcasm are essentially flipping back over the, the machinery to, to say that, that, that I'm being told that this is, uh, a, that up is down and down is up, and irony allows that to be flipped. I would say that, that where we have sort of lost ourselves in the wilderness, I certainly know that I have been, have been lost there in the past, is uh, that the new reality of online existence, of living a substantial portion of your actual time in your body, looking at a screen where the physical aspect of life, like the physical dimension of presence, of your, your presence in your body, the presence of other people who are near you in their bodies, all of those uh, overpowering stimuli of just facial expression and vocal intonation and tact uh, tactile connection that comes with being in a room or in a place with other people, being replaced by a situation where you are engaging with others in a fully disembodied way. And you're choosing who to interact with by a click of a mouse, meaning that you're not actually interacting with anybody. You are, we are all uh, talking to ourselves when we go onto like a social media platform or argue with somebody in a comment section or something. We are, because we are seeking out stimuli. We're seeking out people to get mad at, people to agree with. But we are, seek we are we're seeking them out through our own uh, desire or our own thought of what our desire is. So we're not actually encountering any of these other people. We're encountering these disembodied statements and that we get to imagine a person behind. But that person, because we don't know them, we have no actual experience of them, we can mostly make up. So we're peopling a, a world uh, and we, uh, with characters of our own invention. And so the cultural, uh, the culture that we're making there uh, is not a an attempt to, you know, uh, reverse uh, the lies of the order that we live in to, uh, uh, to pull back the curtain. It is fully accepting 
the parameters, fully accepting the structure of capitalism as eternal, the structure of our separateness from each another as eternal, our solipsism as eternal, and then indulging in it. And so irony becomes essentially a form of masochism. Like it's sadism to others, but because this is all made up, the pain that we imagine we're inflicting on them, it's all in our heads. So we're essentially doing it to ourselves. It's like being caught in a trap, uh, an animal caught in a trap, just chewing on its own flesh. Uh are there dangers around the language and the ideas of the real, and that's the real of a capital R, and the authentic self, capital A, capital S? I Obviously, it's, it's all dangerous to talk about because uh, you're talking about it, you know? Like, as soon as you're using words, you're out, uh, you're lying, you know, in the Nietzschean sense. You're, you're trying to approximate something. And... Everybody who, you, who hears you talk about it is bringing their own definition of those words to, the, to their translation of it, which are not going to be the same as yours. Even if it's word for word the same definition, it does not have the same individual emotional connections because you've had different experiences than them. And so these words get, get turned into uh, fetishes, like authenticity, for example, which is like the prime mania, ma maniacal uh, urge of people online is seeking the authentic. Uh, but it's because, but it's, it's uh, that is a chimera, it cannot happen because it's a, a fallen and, and uh, uh, decayed con uh, version of the con concept. Uh, there is a, there is an authentic authentic itself, and there is a real, uh, but they are inaccessible to language, and as such, it's very difficult to talk about them. But what you end up having to do is essentially talk around them. You have to like I, I I'm getting in the process of trying to write something like uh, uh, that sort of break, breaks down my understanding of like the current political and cultural crisis we're in and, and, and the individual uh, implications of those for our souls and uh, the challenge that we're faced with. And I'm realizing as I'm like figuring out what I wanna say that there are concepts within this that I just cannot talk about. Not because uh, I think I don't, I'm wrong uh, or that I'm not confident that I could express myself to my own satisfaction, but because I know that the people who are going to encounter this are not going to have had my experiences and are not going to be able to take this language the same way it's intended. And so there is this Straussian process of sort of creating spaces for people to make inferences without uh, uh, like alienating or putting people on the wrong track by, by being overly specific about things that are just too close to the bone of the transcendent. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and that's something for perhaps people like me and in my community uh, where we are fairly non-dogmatic, but we are uh, we are encouraging a people to be spiritual in a very literal way, to have spiritual experiences and not to be yeah. afraid of that. Uh, right. but at the same time, not be dogmatic. But at the same time, why are we hanging out together? What is it that we're doing? <laughs> so we have the shared symbol set, right? While yes. recognizing that these shared symbols, that there's, there's limits to them and there's a limit to, to sharing them. Um, and, and I personally, uh, I have a, a, a small community uh, here in Montreal and you know I, I do talk Talk about uh, spirituality, spiritual experiences, things that uh, that could and have happened. But I, I try not to talk about any personal spiritual experiences that I've had, partly for some of the reasons that, that, that you're talking about. Uh, and also because they're almost impossible to put into words. So Yeah, and that, that's why the key is, uh, like you said, getting people together to have shared experiences so that the vocabulary that emerges from those experiences is inflected with a shared emotional response to those words because you all know what you're talking about when you're talking about x or y because you were there together when it happened when, when the feeling happened and, and that's that is what the like 
I have been on my streams trying very hard to pull myself away from prescriptive speech, from prescribing people anything to any, telling anything that they should care about, do, or anything specific. Me, be, because, I mean, uh, it boils down to there's two things I can tell you to do. There's the things involving having opinions and emotions about events, what you should think or feel about X, Y, or Z. And I will maybe give you my idea of what I think is happening, but I will absolutely not tell you how to think about it in that case, because it doesn't matter. Because that is part of that entertainment simulacrum where this is just a thing for you to care about. This is a, this is a Chinese finger trap for you to put your head in while you're avoiding living because it sucks too much to do that, to, to live. Uh, and, but then the other one is like, okay, well, what about the, what about, oh, should I do in my life? And to that one, I say, that answer is not anything I can give you. And it's not anything anybody else can give you. You can find that answer, but only in your actual life, because you will not have some sort of aha, most likely not have some sort of aha, rational thought where you reason yourself to the right thing. You will feel something. And in that feeling, you will adhere that feeling to something close to you. And if you're paying attention, it'll be easy because it'll be literally right in front of you. And then you can follow that feeling to another feeling. And then you have created a chain of emotion. And if you're connecting, and if you're having those feelings with other people, they're having that exact same experience, which means that you are growing these socially dense connections between people. And that is what we can, we're not going to defeat capitalism or even save ourselves from annihilation uh, by using the, the social vocabulary of self-interest to do so. Because our self-interest really, honestly, is in get what you can while you can, because uh, it's all falling apart. Why are you trying to do anything other than care about yourself? Now, a lot of people, because they have values that are connected to like a, a, a genuine human desire to see things better, but that have been perverted by their loneliness more than anything into a pursuit of quixotic uh, political projects, they decide, no, no, I'm going to try to save the world. And, and that is, but the thing is, that's still a, a selfish expression. It's right. still me, it's like, I've decided, no, no, I can't, I, I either can't or I think it's wrong to pile up lucre. Instead, I'm going to try to save the world, but it's all on behalf of an ego. And that means that when social action is coordinated by those reasons, you get infighting, uh, petty bickering, uh, and ab uh, fixation on minutia and a paralysis, just like you do within a person. It's, 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 and for the exact same reasons. Uh, and that is why, historically, the working class, like in Marx, the working class is the class that's going to drive through this because they all share a self-interest, which will then allow them to push through. Problem is now, uh, the, the, in America, our, our combination of geography and uh, empire have allowed us to essentially buy off that existential pain at its root by distributing people throughout the land, creating petty landowning, sort of petty bourgeois out of our white middle class or our white working class, ghettoizing our black working class and, 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 fit, and reinforcing social uh, separations between them that make connection impossible. Uh, and and literally scattering the, the 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 white working class to the winds so that they're living separate lives in, in isolation where they and then destroying the modes of production that allowed for close working conditions like like uh, big factories. Uh, so now people literally do not work in congregation. They do not have any shared understanding of self interest. So even that is now out of the toolkit of the left. I think the only thing that can motivate uh, a bunch of disparate people with disparate narrow self-interests, it cannot be uh, a, a machinery of compulsion because it's going to have to be voluntary because the money's not on our side. You can always walk away. This is all a thing within a thing that is totalizing and has disciplinary mechanisms and mechanisms of temptation that are going to pull you away from it. The only thing that's going to power it are dense social ties of love, of emotion, so that you can't operate against the best interest of the movement because it would hurt you. It would feel, it would feel like pain to you as much as it would feel 
is because you would feel the pain of others. And that's what's going to, I mean, the, how successful it will be in, you know, preventing the fall of the House of Usher, I don't know. Uh, I think that it is possible, and therefore it has happened somewhere and will happen somewhere, uh, and maybe it'll be here. Uh, but if whatever resistance to total atomization comes, it will be forged by those connections. Yeah. Um, a related question going back to, to talking about uh, irony and authenticity. Matt, how do we leave irony behind and go for sincerity and even go for cringe when genuineness and sensitivity, they've been made part of people's personal branding strategy. Like I've seen a lot of to toxicity, uh, actually I'll just say evil, <laughs> coming from people whose public personality is built around being authentic and being sensitive. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, and honestly, I feel like that's one of the things that makes people really want to cling to their irony. It's because they see how many people use a smug virtuousness who use the fact that they would never be ironic and never uh, use a slur uh, at being just the most petty, vindictive freaks, just awful people. And so it's essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a condition of the generalized mistrust of living online as we do, because we are all operating from self-interest, which means we have to assume that everyone we interact with is, and remember, because they're just a projection of us, they are. And so when we encounter anybody else online that we don't really have a friend relationship to or like a durable, uh, mutually uh, beneficial relationship with, an outsider, an enemy in the Schmidtian sense, uh, when we encounter them, uh, we have to assume that they basically are all of, uh, all of the worst parts of us. Yeah. They're all the parts of us that we hate about ourselves, minus the self-exculpatory stuff. Because the thing that makes you not hate someone, even no matter what bad they do, is if you understand why they did it. Yeah. If you understand why somebody did something, or even you can feel like you can make sense of their actions from, why they, from within them, you can't feel hatred for them. Because didn't, you don't, they didn't do it on purpose. There is no evil intent there. There is only misfortune. There is the misfortune they've encountered that drove them in that direction. So that's why you can never really hate yourself, no matter how much self-loathing is, is the lingua franca of the internet. Really, everyone loves themselves. They love themselves too much. The demiurge is us. The demiurge is our egos. Uh, but we also lived our whole lives, and so we know why we are the way we are. So we, we accept it. Everybody else we encounter online is all the evil stuff, all the evil stuff that's in us, but without any explanation, without any, without any exculpatory story. We can, we can just instead fill that with the worst interpretation so that we can hate them, so that we can have hatred for them. And that means that when you say stop, stop using you know abusive irony. Stop, stop attacking. Uh, the response will be, well, okay. If I do, what about them? What are they going to do? I am at their mercy then. And I would say that uh, online specifically. I mean, this goes into all levels of like activism, and it's one of the main things that makes uh, it impossible to have intersectional uh, politics in the way a lot of people think you can. Because people's first people will the, the, the intersection comes with inherent uh, mistrust for the outgroup, assumption of self-interest of the outgroup, which means that we have to, uh, like in a prisoner's dilemma, uh, operate from self-interest of our group, which means we cannot negotiate like a collective agenda. We have to fight for primacy among all groups because that's the only uh, because we can't trust that anybody else won't just screw us over if we act first in the best interest of all. They will fuck us over and we can't, and we uh, rationally reject to do that. So that's a problem that exists all through all structures of uh, activism and, and human relationship and has to be worked through. Online though, it's a really is a thing where you can cut the Gordian knot because it's like, okay, fine, you put the weapons down. You stop having to build up this bile to justify being mean to people. 
and they and you get nothing for it. Nobody nobody credits you, and they decide that they're going to use it to own you. Uh, so what? Okay, big deal. Like your online persona is injured. Somebody has cringed at you. Does this matter in any sense? And if the answer is it does, well, then you have work to do. You have work to do detaching yourself from that emotional relationship because it is voluntary. And like I said, like the hope of the world is that we can all change because it is a self-conscious act. It's, it is what, like we have free will because although it feels like we're on rails, and there is like a, a, a physical determination for all actions. Uh, we also have the ability to think ahead of our brains, basically, because of the thought occurs at a quantum space. Thought occurs beyond cause and effect. Like that's a fact. Like mental processes begin at a level at, uh, of size where we know by observation, conventional cause and effect breakdown. And that means that actions taken at that point can move ahead of the fucking billiard ball. But for most of us, we are so programmed by our experiences and by a world that beats us and traumatizes us into a deformed relationship with the world and a perceived separateness that we need to protect. And that powers a terror that powers us forward along these, like, uh, the, on these guidelines. If we can take time and not allow those emotional reactions to shape our actions. We can like take that quantum time within us and move out of love instead. And once you do that, you have literally jumped rails into a different reality. Like you're in the same physical world, the stuff's still there, but there is now another dimension to experience. There is an emotional, I, like a hum, I guess I would say. Like th that, that isolated feeling that I know I grew into is like a hyper alienated, hyper intellectualized, late 20th century American, a Nietzschean last man. I know that the world felt different, felt emotionally different at a moment by moment basis than it does now to me for the majority of my life. Like there was a, an empty room was quiet in a, the reason, and I think this is the reason people can't have quiet why people have to have the TV on all the time. People have to have something in their ear. It's because they can't hear the silence because the silence is separateness. The silence is death. The silence is you are one mind that is in a decaying flesh body. You're a universe that will end. But there is another world that is exactly like the world you live in where that quiet is not empty, that, that there is a, that there is a imminence within it. And that imminence is your connection to everything around you. The fact that this is not a bunch of stuff. It appears to you as a bunch of stuff and you interact with it with a bunch of stuff. These aren't a bunch of other people. These are all parts of one, one universal being, so a, a, a awareness and a body that you are a part of. And in, if that's true, and you can't think yourself to it, but you can feel it on a moment by moment basis. If that's true, then that can rob the, 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 the every question that you have to answer yourself of every day about what you need to do. Like wh which door to open it can rob that door. It can, or it can rob that question of the compulsory machinery of like capitalist Skinner box, Pavlovian uh, compulsion. The, 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 the enslavement of the demiurge. Yeah. If you're not afraid, because it's like, obviously, if you get really close to death, you'll still be afraid of death just because of, for most of us, we haven't spent our life on a monastery, like, you know, attaining a sense of, you know, detachment from worldly needs. We have been, spent our lives attached to shit. So if it's coming at us, it's going to be very scary. But most of our decisions are not life and death decisions. But they are charged with this fear of losing out on pleasure, losing out on distraction from oblivion. If you're not worried about losing that, you can pick a door that's different and you can be liberated, even if you still live within this machinery of capitalism. And even if you still have to you know, render under Caesar, you are not doing so under the lash 
you are doing so as a free person who is only able to operate that way because you're not afraid anymore. Because you know that, and, and not being afraid means you can understand and love everything because none of it is a threat to you. Yeah, I, I think there's a reason why the phrase "be not afraid" pops up in the canonical Bible quite a bit. Yeah, um, and uh, some uh, some religions, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, some forms of Gnosticism, even talk about warrior spirituality, which can sound kind of cheesy when you bring it up, but it's about bringing that that kind of courage of not yeah. being afraid to go to those places. Uh, I also think too of of some of the Gnostic mythos, where unlike in some other systems that view humanity as a, divine or at least potentially divine theosis you have to become divine you have to work really hard at it and then you yeah. can be worthy of becoming divine in gnosticism you're already divine yeah. and, but you you don't know it yeah, uh, and exactly. i and you, yeah and you can't know it by me telling it to you you have to know it through going through this process through the experiences that you're talking about um yes matt this is uh Okay, so a lot of people think I'm being prescriptive instead of descriptive when I talk about the bad things, in my opinion, that happened when uh, religion was taken out of public life. Now, I know you're, you're thinking, hey, I live in America. There still seems to be lots of religion here. But uh, religious attendance is, is dropped across the board throughout most of the, the first world, the developed world, whatever you want to call it, right? Including the United States. A lot of people don't seem to realize evangelicals are loud, but church church attendance is dropping, okay? Like, we're living in secular societies. So uh, I obviously don't want to go back to the bad old days of school prayer and, you know, that having the expectation of belonging to a specific uh, sect. But at the same time, I think waking up one morning and removing religion, trying to remove religion 100% uh, from a society has caused some bad things. So, for example, like, like, this is kind of hack, but it's kind of hack to point out that, like, QAnon or some expressions of Vidpol or Stan Culture or the Chapel subreddit are religions. <laughs> um, but uh, that said, there's actually some fascinating work coming out from, from some sociologists of religion uh, who are confused because we live in pretty stressful times, right, Matt? And mm -hmm. they're confused about why aren't people joining more cults? Why isn't cult attendance going up? Because in other times, like the 1970s, in other times of great uh, social and economic uh, unrest, people go looking for answers, they join cults. Uh, so sociologists are like, why aren't people why aren't people joining cults right now? The world's super messed up. And one of the theories why not is that the the sort of person who would join a cult instead is becoming a Marvel movie fan, right? They're, they're joining, they're joining Stan culture. Um, so all this said, do you think all these people in communities would just be happier and healthier if they just found Jesus? You know what? I, I can't, this is the question. Like, how do you try to turn this into a politics, you know? And it's like, if everybody found Jesus, that could do the job. But the problem is, what does Jesus mean? You know, like, uh, how do you turn that into a public symbol that has an agreed upon meaning? Because there are plenty of people in the uh, in the exurban um, uh, McMansion belts of this country who believe in their hearts in Jesus. They, they believe in Jesus deeply. Now, they actually believe literally in the devil. They're literal devil worshipers, which is pretty, it's a funny little twist. Like, I mean... You, I'm surprised nobody's ever done that. Like they did Rosemary's Baby with like the Upper West Side rich people, but it really like, literally like uh, American Protestantism at this point, which is consumed American Christianity in general, really is essentially Satan worship. Uh, and how the hell do you use the same words that mean to millions of people, and not just people who are evangelical Christian, but people who have encountered evangelical Christianity, to literally mean the devil? You know, and I don't know the answer to that. I certainly do uh, think, though, that there has to be a, uh, a reinvestment of some religious conceptions with meaning that cut through our culture war conceptions of religion, which they're really just armor for our combat with one another. Like they're just the symbol we put on our, on our shield as we go to fight for resources, which we're piling up for no fucking reason. Because we imagine that we're going to create heaven on earth in the form of a fucking Ten Commandments uh, based uh, water theme park. Uh, and, by, and 
that means that the spirituality, the public spirituality to come, and it will involve people who are currently of all number of faiths and who feel those faiths deeply uh, and actually connect those symbols to love as it is and as it always will be, <coughs> are going to come together. Uh, I don't know what it's going to look like, though. And that's another thing where I can't get too ahead of myself in terms of prescribing because more than anything, I am... I am someone who has lived my life to this point as one of the most isolated monads available. I am right up there with the hikimori in terms of my disconnection from social existence for the vast majority of my life. And I'm only now even close to coming into contact with like with other people at a social level where I'm interacting with people not out of a desire to be distracted or to have my ego reinforced but out of a genuine desire to just be in the presence of others. This is the first time I'm really feeling that in my life. And uh, it's going to take me a while to build up any kind of durable social connections that can correspond to uh, like a language that could make sense to me or anybody else. So I'd say I would give that one just like a TBD. Like give, give, give me some time on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's it, it's something uh, uh, we talk a lot about on the show, particularly when we talk about politics and culture. And something I spend a lot of time thinking and talking to people about is my thesis is, is that we have forgotten relatively quickly, but within the last 20, 30, uh, 35 years, how to live in community. Yes, and exactly. And we, we have to relearn, and I'm including myself within that. Uh, and, you know, I, as I said, I am someone involved of a restorationist Gnostic church, right? We've, right. we've got a lot. We're doing it all for, no, I shouldn't say all, but we're doing it from scratch. Yeah. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't really have the answers either, both to how to build community, but also just as a participant, how to yes. properly live in community. I exactly. have some hints, I, and I know, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not completely there. Um, uh, I will say this though. I think that the second coming. I mean, if we if we pull this off, it's it will have been the second coming. It will be Jesus returning. I will say that. I hundred percent believe that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. The uh, the the ancient Cho and I uh, Gnostics. Uh, they they stopped waiting for the second coming because they believed that the the community was the second coming. Jesus Absolutely. had come, but not in the hearts of individuals. Yeah. Right. Right. Jesus was the community. That yeah. was the second coming. Exactly. Um, the uh uh okay we're getting here on time uh, the last thing i'll say is uh for this 21st century spirituality which of course you've been dancing around because you don't know what it's going to look like i don't know mm -hmm. what it's going to look like but i i do really hope and really think it's coming and, and again sociologists of religion have uh ha have a theory that that religion really has an oomph people go looking for answers after they have children or when someone close to them like their parents die right mm -hmm. uh and of course because of demographic shifts yeah uh, <laughs> people are not having children and they're not having them as soon and their parents are living a heck of a lot longer yeah right yeah, yeah. So, so that might be a part of the impetus, uh, as well as I'm also fairly convinced, unfortunately, that the world is is not getting better anytime soon. So, yeah. hopefully, this this demographic shift and this uh, very obviously uh, gnostic, demiurgic, black iron prison world does push people into whatever this 21st uh, century spirituality is is going to be. Um, yes, that's I've said that before. It's like there's there is pressure on this structure that it cannot contain. Um, okay, so final question, Matt. Uh, what's your favorite Gnostic-influenced piece of art or media? Uh, 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 oh, uh, I would say uh, Avatar. Excellent answer. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a great one, and yeah. the Gnostic themes are are right up there, right up front. Uh, it's it's a great one for uh, the, uh people in my community. We we often uh, we switched over from the Matrix to Avatar. Yeah, in, in it's the number one movie of all time. People are yeah. they want it, they know it, they don't know it why, but they don't know it. And that movie, the way that it was so beloved when people saw it, and it, and then all of that, it all like went away culturally. People like to smugly point out that it doesn't have a cultural imprint. It's because you couldn't you couldn't give it a marketable, memeable language because it was an emotion, yeah. and you cannot turn that into culture because it's, it's good and culture only reproduces evil. Yes.
Yeah, exactly. Okay, Matt, uh, before we go, uh, do you have any plugs? You, you uh, my, col- my Chapo colleague, Felix Biederman, and I are, are doing a, uh, a show on Stitcher right now about uh, the, like, the growth and evolution and development of prestige television dramas in America. Uh, we talk about the big ones like your Sopranos and your The Wire, uh, but also just a lot of stuff like Lost. Uh, and we just kind of break them apart for like themes of empire in decline. Yeah. Uh, very excellent. Okay, everybody check that out at stitcher.com. Time for my stories. And of course, if you want to join Matt's cult, it's kushbomb on twitter.com. <laughs> I'm going to quickly do my plug. Sorry, Matt, before we, yeah, go before we hang up, which is. Uh, I teach uh, secular meditation. I'm doing training to teach uh, secular meditation that's open for all, sort of on top of the Gnostic stuff. Obviously, right now, I'm doing it outside of the house. I'm doing it for free every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We've got a good crowd of people. Uh, Even when I go back to doing it in person, uh, I I use a local yoga studio here in in Montreal. I'm still going to be streaming those classes online. Uh, I give instruction. It's good for both beginners, and it's good for both those uh, who have experience with meditation. It's about 45 Five minutes to an hour feel free to come in at any time it's basically uh every sunday mylandmeditation.substack.com uh i have a parish here in montreal the holy grail parish uh we meet every second sunday yet again we're normally in person we're doing it online it's mostly a meditation night feel free to come out and check it out uh, again we're not dogmatic we're not going to require you to convert or believe a bunch of things and as i said it's pretty based upon meditation practice okay Okay, well, that's uh, it, it's been awesome having you, Matt. Uh, the, that was just an incredible show, and it was uh, so much fun. So, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. It was great. <laughs>